see on the screen, this is an update related to our district configuration stuff. So let me begin at the beginning. Why was this study even done? And while I will not read to you from a PowerPoint slide, I will highlight some of the comments. One of the things that our Board of Education has been committed to for many years is trying to maintain reasonable class size at all grades, looking at lower class size or the younger grades, and then, you know, generally speaking, it increases as the students uh, grow and age and develop. In addition to that, with four schools of the same configuration, we try at each grade level to maintain some level of consistency between and among the schools. And that is an annual task uh, for our administrative team, particularly as our community has become more and more transient with families not just moving uh, between and among schools within Galloway, but also uh, in the county and in and out of the county. Um, at some of our schools in recent years, we had space issues, where spaces have had, uh, had to be shared, uh, different years, we've had to put preschool class in different schools. Years, the band has a room, the band doesn't have a room, this teacher's on a part. So depending on how the population fell, we were having annual fluctuations. And those space issues were related to the number of homerooms needed to provide that reasonable class size. So what was happening is at budget time, uh, Mrs. Nixon, our school business administrator, and myself were going to the board saying, can we get a relocatable? Can we put a wall up? Can we take a wall down? Trying to do things um, to resolve and address these issues and bring about some stabilization. So in having these discussions, the board, uh, in its responsibility to the children, but also all stakeholders in our community set forth the challenge that could we look at redistricting or reconfiguration before we're adding a relocatable or doing larger construction, be it addition or something like that. And I do want to take a moment and define the difference between these two words. Redistricting would mean that we would look at the attendance zones where is the line drawn for children to go to Reeds Road? Where are the lines drawn for children to go to Smithville? And we would move those lines. Reconfiguration does not necessarily move those lines. The attendance zones stay the same, but perhaps the grade levels that attend a school are what change. And as you will see as I work my way through the presentation, there could also be the combination of those two things. So uh, one of the things that the members of the committee, men around who are here tonight, and at some point I will ask you to stand, um, one of the things they heard me, uh, broken record technique, is no decision has been made. This is not something where I woke up one day, or Ms. Nixon, or a principal, or, or President Carmen, or Vice President Days, or any other board member woke up and said, we're making this change next week. We're making this change next year. Again, the charge was, let's study this to see what solutions we can arrive at that are educationally sound, possible, and fiscally responsible. So the first phase actually was spent at the administrative level with certain staff members at the district office helping us. And obviously there were discussions with the board. We formed this administrative committee. And then we brainstormed lots of different things that we could do to answer this question. We spent a lot of time looking at demographic data. Everything from how many children attend a school, uh, male, female, ethnicity and race, uh, free and reduced meals, uh, ESL, all those different demographics that make up uh, us as human beings and our school population. We 
talked about with different redistricting or reconfiguration, what are the impacts on the children, on the culture of the school and the district? Certainly, our main focus here is to teach the children and to help them learn and develop. We looked at professional literature, and then, of course, there's the buildings themselves. What are the aspects of each of our schools that may be a positive or a detriment to various configurations? We identified uh, scenarios liable for further study, reported back to the board, and then we determined that we had done enough administratively in district, and it was time to step out for more stakeholder involvement. I will pause a moment. Um, these are the members that worked on the committee last year. If you are here this evening, if I could ask you to just stand or wave. You don't have to give a speech or anything, just to let people know who you are. I was a shy group tonight. Um, you'll know one of the folks retired, and uh, a little while, our new transportation director is here and has been involved. So I wanted to take a moment and highlight some of the things we saw in the professional literature. And probably the most important thing I can tell you is you could find an article, an opinion, or a study to support almost any configuration. So two of the articles that stood out the most talked about the kinds of things you should look at. What should you research? What should you analyze? What should you consider when you're conducting such a study? And again, I'm not going to read this to you, but this particular article talked about nine factors that you should consider. And although I said a few minutes ago that our main purpose is instruction, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that getting the children to and from school is one of the biggest factors in anything related to making a decision about what child attends what school. Uh, you can see other things. How will it affect parental involvement? How far away is the home from the school? How many schools will the child's family attend? Uh, obviously things, grade level, number of homerooms. Um, you know, some, there were some studies that looked at student achievement and different grade configurations. Do you have true neighborhood schools? Um, and if so, should you keep them? Um, how many transitions? One of the things, interactions between age groups. Uh, many of us have heard of those big buddy, little buddy kinds of programs. Uh, and then the building design again. So this was one article that named nine factors. Uh, you know, continuing to look at things, here's a different article but the same topic. What should you be considering when you're thinking about a new configuration? And if you look at this list, it has many of the same exact things. And so while we worked our way through this process, particularly this phase two on which I'm recording tonight, these were a lot of our guiding questions and a lot of the discussions we had, not just administratively, but with all of the committee members. Um, this particular study came from the National Association of Secondary School Principals, and some people put middle school at the elementary level, some people put it at the high school level. I personally put it, what it's called, in the middle. Um, but there is uh, some newer research related to the middle school concept, and making sure that in a middle school we are doing things that help promote student achievement, good culture, and so some of the findings um, out of this article, and you can see numerous different authors and studies, looked at general things, for example, this first item, um, you know, things with the most likely explanation where they saw positive performance. Um, but then they say, be, this article, be careful about applying findings to all public schools. One of the things in the research about middle schools tended to be more focused on purely urban areas. Um, we are a much more mixed type of school district. One of the most important things 
Is it a middle school in name only, or it is a middle school in concept? And our middle school is a middle school in concept. There are houses, there are teams, things that make the big place small. This particular quote, for me, was one of the most important ones in anything we looked at. And obviously, it is the programs and the practices, not necessarily the grades themselves, that really make the quality. And I would dare say it is the people that really make a difference. I see so many parents here this evening, and you know, when that classroom door closes, that relationship, that learning process between your children and the teachers really matters. And perfect for this week, which is teacher appreciation. So in phase one, again, that administrative group with certain district office staff, we looked at a number of different scenarios and did our analysis, thinking about factors, particularly looking at the data. And coming out of that, on the left, you will see scenarios that we felt were viable for further study. It didn't mean we were recommending them. We felt there was enough evidence to look at them deeper. On the right, you will see ones that we did not see as viable. And I'm going to give you an example. We tried to redraw the attendance zones to make more neighborhood kinds of schools. It threw everything else off. If you think of Galloway being 92 square miles and all of the rich diversity in our community, we were creating a bigger problem instead of solving one. Just a moment, you may have lived here your whole life. Um, you may be an adult who went to school here, who now has a child here. Um, but Galloway has changed configuration many times because as the community grew and grew and grew, and then went decreased to a certain extent, that has impacted the schools. So at one point in time, it was K-8. There was not a middle school. There wasn't a you know, kindergarten center that there was at one point. The middle school has taken on various grade level configurations over the years. At one time, we had many small schools. Uh, some of them are still being used. Some of them are empty lots. Some of them the district does not even own the property. And those of you who attended one of those small schools, we know a lot of that has emotion with it. Um, you know, those decisions were made based on how well those schools could be used to educate the children. Um, GTMS being built was a double win. And by that I mean our community got this beautiful middle school and we were able to turn Rain into an elementary school. And that was the benchmark that allowed our community in 2002, I believe, to get full day kindergarten. Um, so we're fortunate that we've had full day kindergarten all those years. This last section, you may already know this, tells you what we have today. Pomona Preschool, four schools of K-6, sometimes with a preschool, one middle school. You may or may not know that Ocean Hill School is used for facilities and food service and provides some storage space. That even though the schools are no longer there, we still own the Cologne and South Haven Park properties. And finally, the district also owns a piece of property off of Jimmy Leeds Road that has never been used. Just to show you this, this is, we picked a moment in time, and the current data we looked at. So this is a map, and I will tell you that green, where you see a 0 15, that is our grand school. Where you see this orange, that is Reed's Road School. Where you see this, I don't know, pink, purple, we won't get into that. That is Roland Rogers School. And then over here you see Smithville, that is blue. And one of the things anyone who's driven around Galloway knows is there are some densely populated areas of our community, and there are much more rural parts of our community. So hence, we have some times where it's very condensed children going to a particular school, and sometimes it is more spread. 
um, maybe a little tighter look of that same type of information. When we look at that moment in time with enrollment, you can see the total enrollment of each school. 671 for Rand, 548 for Reeves, 572 for Roland, 634 for Smithville, uh, 750 for the middle school, and 118 at Pomona. I will make this note. Each of these four schools is not the same exact size, <coughs> excuse me, and it's not the same design. Roland and Smithville are the same design. You might be asking, if Roland and Smithville are the same design, why is there a difference in the number of children? One of the things in the district currently is that there are different self-contained special ed classes at different schools. And so the majority of our LLD classes are at Roland. <clears throat> and because a self-contained special ed class does not have as many children as a gen ed class, a room being used just for special ed doesn't house as many children. <clears throat> now we look at each school by grade level. And it's not surprising that the schools that you saw with a higher population like Rand, when you look at the grade levels, they're either about the same or even higher than the other schools. Our community has a wonderful diversity. We're a microcosm of the entire world. Um, and so one of the things we do look at is what are the different groups, the different major groups represented in our community, and where are they currently attending school. Um, you know, sometimes what can we make this perfectly even? That can be challenging because of where people naturally may choose to live in the community. Uh, the history of our country, for example, is when people immigrate to the United States, very often they go with their first relatives, and that can have an impact. But this is a factor when we study the different scenarios we need to look at. One of the other factors we look at is economically disadvantaged. And just to remind you with this little note, just to remind you with that little note, um, that means a child and a family qualifies <coughs> for free or reduced meals, breakfast and lunch. And you can see for the most part, at all of our schools, about 50% of the children qualify and about 50% do not. That yellow band shows children who at one point did qualify but did not when we set this data point this year. <clears throat> we then look at special education. Now this is not based on where the child lives. This is based on where the um, program is. So a family might live in the RAND zone. However, the child is in an LLD class and might go to Roland. Or the child is in a class specialized for autism and might go to Reeds. Or the child might live in the Reed zone but needs our moderate a multiple disabilities functional class and would attend RAND. <clears throat> this is our ESL. And again, we not only showed you, and these are numbers of children, not percentages, we not only showed you in blue who currently qualifies for ESL, but the number of children in each school that at one point in their school career with us qualify. And then again, at the moment in time we were working on this, this was the average class size at each grade at each school. So when you look at this, and when we, when we draft this and project this at budget time each year, we try to make sure that even if the numbers cannot be exact, there's not too wide of a gap. Kindergarten is always a bit of a, a, a roll of the dice. Uh, I'll use a casino analogy, when we're planning the budget because the registration is just happening. Um, so we do our best to project and then monitor that in the summer. And so you can see in some instances you have lots of nice clustering, but then you might have one 
that's a little bit higher. And again, what we are experiencing each year is fluctuations in this. As the grade level moves up, as people move in and out. Um, in different years, in different schools. A uh, week before school opened, the week school opened, we've added a classroom or added a classroom assistant because the number shot up at the end of the summer. So, phase one encapsulated. Now I'm moving into phase two. And as I mentioned, we talked about a representative stakeholder committee and via various means, email, Facebook, all different things, we invited anyone who wanted to join this committee to participate. And I will tell you, more than 80 people responded to that initial invitation, and many of them came to the very first meeting. Once we had that introductory meeting on February 12th, um, administratively talked, how much do we need to shrink this committee? There were more than 60 people. And ultimately, we really did not. Anyone who attended that initial meeting was invited to stay on the committee. The only exception was, in some instances, there were both parents. We asked that each family only have one member. So ultimately, we ended up with a 65-person committee. Parents, staff members, people that are both a staff member and a parent, administrators, um, and when I say staff members, different categories, teachers, classroom assistants, um, transportation, um, child study team, all the different categories and all of the schools were represented. We met four times, um, and each time we met, we dug into different scenarios, into the data. For many of the meetings, um, it was groups by school, and then each school would, I didn't bring the posters and put them up, but they would make a poster of the key points from their discussion so that everybody could see what they discussed when we were studying a scenario. What was a pro? What was a con? What's a question? What don't we know the answer to? For me to think this scenario would work, this is what I would need. And then those notes were typed up and shared. And so I, I absolutely must say it was an amazing group who spent several hours each of those notes digging into this data, asking questions, having open discussions. Um, I actually talked um, with student council earlier in the year, and some of the kids actually wrote me letters. Finding out, you know, now you're in middle school, looking back, what would you have thought if we changed the grade levels? And interestingly enough, the opinions were all over the place. There were some student council kids from the middle school who thought it was the greatest idea in the world, because in their mind, gosh, it, maybe if it was just fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, you could be more excited. Then there were some who were like, no way. I like staying in my school the whole time. So with the students, we saw some of the same things that the adults asked and questioned. And it was great to get to hear from those students. So this is the phase two committee. And if I really could ask you to stand up, wave, because you deserve it. You did a tremendous job. Come on, don't be shy. Glad you're here tonight.
Diane Smith go with Arthur Rain? Well, if you have a photographic memory and go back to the data slide, Reeves and Rowland have fewer students, and Smithville and Rand have more students. So pairing those two smaller schools would leave empty spaces, and pairing those two higher enrollment schools would make the problem worse, not better. So there were certain pairings that just logically worked and certain that did not. So we looked at these two K3s and two four sixes. We then looked at um, could one school be a 5-6 school and the other schools K-4? And we did that with different combinations. So these were scenarios we had talked about in that phase one. Out of the committee came a request, could we kind of flip-flop this? Could we look at one school being K-1 and the other schools being 2-6? the reverse. So I want you to think about people sitting at a table and they're getting data about what would class size look like. They're looking at how many homes are needed to have reasonable class size and how many rooms are in the building. They're looking at that data about the free and reduced meals, the ESL, um, the race and ethnicity, because part of analyzing it is we want to make sure that as much as possible our schools are representations of the community. So, I am now going to touch on different scenarios. Um, I'm going to go back to that list for a moment. At the last meeting, the question I gave that stakeholder committee was if the board said you have to reconfigure even if reconfiguration isn't your first choice, if the board decided reconfiguration is happening, which of the scenarios we study do you believe is the most viable? And so now I'm going to click. And the answer to that question was the K346 scenario. And again, I'm not saying that was the committee's number one recommendation. The committee has a lot of ideas, as you will see. But should it be simply about reconfiguration of the current four elementary schools, this was the most viable. On the left, you can see a list of positives. And again, I do not want to read word for word to you. But one of them, which is a big one, is basically transportation could stay the same. And I will say, not only were we fortunate on this committee to have our own transportation coordinator, but also from Greater Bay Harbor, um, we have their transportation coordinator. And I think those ladies are sitting together, uh, Debbie Kaufman and Michelle from being happy to say thank you. Um, we talked about, could we adjust start times to ease traffic that reads and roll it? We felt it would help cons bring consistency and stabilization to that class size with the idea that if there's more homerooms of the same grade level in two schools instead of four, it's easier to even them out. One of the things about reconfiguration versus redistricting is if I'm a student and Mrs. Nixon's a student and Mrs. Tapalco, if we're three students and we're friends and we go to Arthur Rand School for kindergarten and first and second and third grade, when we hit fourth grade, we're not being split up. We're going together with all the rest of our friends finishing third grade to fourth grade. And while I don't know that there's educational research about student achievement to support that, but I know when I've talked to parents for the last 35 years, that is very often on a family's mind. Um, this scenario enabled us to either enhance or maintain the demographics. We talked about um, when you don't have teachers at the same grade level divided divide among four schools, when you narrow that to two, you can build better consistency and fidelity in curriculum. The teachers have more people at the same grade level to work with and plan on a regular basis. We also talked about the fact that you can build a culture 
tailored to that particular grade. So younger children aren't hearing announcements that they might not understand, or older kids don't think things are baby about. So they are some of the things that the committee came up with as positives to this configuration. You can see the list of questions and concerns is equally, if not greater. And this ranged from, well, if we did this, which two schools would be K-3 and which two schools would be 4-6? Um, we talked about additional transitions. Instead of a child spending a long time in one school, they're going to have fewer years with an additional transition. And some people brought out, would that have a cultural impact on um, families, on the school? Uh, we talked about, obviously, we would need to do a personnel analysis. You know, what teachers are staying in that school or transferring to another? What um, other staff members, any category, would have to be changed? Um, one of the things that came up from a number of parents was, now I'm going to an extra back to school night, an extra one of this, that those special activities are more repetitive. One of the big things that we spent a lot of time talking about was um, the facilities. And I will talk specifically about Arthur Rand for a moment. When discussing if we did this kind of configuration, what would Arthur Rand be? We could argue it both ways more than any other school. And what I mean by that is, I could make the argument that Rand doesn't have the stage. It has the smallest gym, the smallest library, and the smallest cafeteria. So it would make a really nice K-3 school. The con side of that is, it has the fewest classrooms with bathrooms in the room. And so you debate that stuff. Um, so we looked at that from all different angles. And uh, you know, you'll know, you see as I go through other ideas from the committee where some of those discussions led. <coughs> Um, if we did this configuration, it would definitely affect, um, for, uh, not definitely, excuse me, it could possibly affect for some children the length of their bus ride. Um, it could affect start time changes. Now, that's not necessarily a negative. Some people might think that's great. Um, obviously, things like Big Buddy um, that you're able to do in the K school, K6 school, those kinds of opportunities with upper grade elementary children and lower grade elementary children in the same building, you decrease those opportunities. Obviously, if the board decided they wanted this configuration considered even further, we would have to answer all these questions. And one of the big questions that would have to be answered is, what would it cost to do this? While education is the most important piece, we can't ignore the fact that there's a budget. And the budget only has so much funding. So again, from all those configurations we studied, with this stakeholder committee, when they were asked, name the one, if you had to reconfigure, would be the most viable, this was the response. As we were going through the meetings, um, I did not sit with a particular group. I, I was a floater in the room. Um, I heard a lot of other ideas come out. And so the other thing that the committee did was they came up with different scenarios other than just this type of reconfiguration or just a redistricting. And um, for several of the meetings, people worked by school. For this last meeting, I actually um, was like the teacher on the first day of school, and there were seating charts. There were mixed groups. So although the committee members spent a lot of time talking, <coughs> just people from one school with some district administrators spotted in between, this last night, they sat with a mixed group. And so here are some of the other ideas. One of the other ideas is leave the configuration exactly as it is, and where a school is short on space, add a relocate wall. Um, when we got the preschool expansion grant, that's what we did at Pomona School. So again, 
you see positives and you see questions and concerns. And obviously, um, let's face it, we're humans, we don't like change. So in this um, idea, everything that people love about K6, they still have, because it would still be K6. <coughs> but then you get into what would the cost of the relocatable be? What would the site preparation be? Um, because you would need bathrooms in them. Additionally, we would have to find out if the Department of Education even approved us adding a relocatable. And then when we look at some of the other facilities issues we discussed, it would not address any of them. The second idea was to keep the current configuration, but instead of a relocatable, actually do some type of addition or expansion to the building. And so this left side stays exactly the same because it's still K6. The right side has some of the same points as the relocatables. Obviously, you would have construction costs. Um, how much might an addition be that is a greater cost, generally speaking, than a relocatable? And, you know, if we don't have the money in what's called capital reserve, are we doing a referendum? Is the board doing the least purchase? This would require um, extensive work with the architect and the Department of Ed approval, and it may or may not address some of the other concerns we discussed. Now we move away from the current configuration, and the next idea was, could we bring the sixth grade here to GTMS? And uh, in a very informal fashion, I did ask the architect, is there space on this property to add a wing of classrooms that would house all the sixth graders? And the answer to that question is yes. And so then we get again the positive and negatives. For the middle school experience itself, it would give the children a third year here. And that would help the middle school build that culture with the children there for three years in a row instead of two and out. Um, sixth grade could be brought into some of those co-curricular activities and sports and things that we can't replicate four times right now. Um, for many adolescents, this would support their developmental level. And it would obviously, if we pull all the sixth grade out, we would gain those spaces at the elementary schools. And certainly the early middle level research and some of the current research um, and certainly in the state of New Jersey, middle school defined by New Jersey is considered to be 6 to 8. Uh, if you're wondering, then why didn't we make this building 6 to 8 when we built it? Very simple question. There's a bonding capacity. This building cost $18.9 million. It opened in the year 2000. There was no more money available to the district and the municipality to be able to make it a 6 to 8 middle school. So, all right, what's the downside? Well, obviously cost, adding, doing that addition. Where is that money coming from? The architect, the DOE approval. Um, some of the other needs of the other schools might not be addressed. We believe if we added another grade level, the committee felt what you need a sixth grade assistant principal, a sixth grade counselor, the way you have those positions following the children in, um, 7th and 8th grade. It would take the total number of students at the current time over 1,100. And as I showed you earlier, there is some, especially, and we are not in an urban area, but some research that says the more adolescents you put together, the more challenging they sometimes become. So again, this is another idea that came out of the committee. The next idea, you heard me mention very early on that we own a piece of property. So one of the ideas was, we really like that early childhood center concept. So let's build one on that piece of property that the board already owns. So what are the positives of that? Well, obviously you design a school that is for young children. Um, you can, again, narrow down the grades, the curriculum, the uh, fidelity and consistency. Everyone in the building becomes an expert on that um, grade level, the themes. One of the things I 
duty to say out loud if the board ever decided to do this. It doesn't mean there's preschool for every child. It could allow us to get a more consistent location for preschool, and obviously it would open space at the elementary schools, whether it was K-1, K-1-2, um, something like that would have to be further studied. Again, we go to this side, and you're going to see a lot of the same things. The cost, the redoing of the transportation, and what that might cost. This would require redistricting, because if we're building a elementary, uh, excuse me, a primary school, and those children are leaving, someone else has to move to fill in the space. Um, transportation would be a major issue. It would have to go out to bid. And then we would have to determine would we maintain Pomona as a preschool or would we go to some other use. The next scenario starts the same. Build a new school. And in this scenario, it's pre-K-6 or could possibly be a K-6. So this comes from the folks that we like it the way it is, but let's do a new one. And so on the left, you're going to maintain what we have now, that K is 6. Um, it's fewer transitions. You can still do the big buddies. There's not as many schools for parents to attend. And again, it would create space. Cons or questions or concerns, again, are very similar. The cost, the construction, where is the funding coming from? Would we still need Pomona? We would definitely need redistricting if we build another K-6 school. And again, it would impact transportation. So, I'm going to just give it over for a moment. So I just want to very quickly name all of this again. Out of the scenarios we initially studied, K-346 was named as the most viable. The other ideas from the committee, current configuration with relocatables where needed. Current configuration with additions where needed. Add uh, an addition to the middle school, moving sixth grade. Early childhood center, new building. Elementary school, new building. So, what has to happen? Well, the, obviously there's not a decision made. There wasn't a decision made before we started the committee, and there's still not one at this moment. Obviously, any of these scenarios involves analyzing what would have to happen to facilities and what would the cost be. How would it impact transportation? Transportation basically stays the same. That factor goes out. If transportation is changing in any way, that is a tremendous process. How would it impact staffing? We would have to look at where special education self-contained programs are now and how would we have to replicate them. Um, and I'll just, for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, if you have a self-contained special ed class, say an LLD class, and it has kindergartners and first graders in it, you must have general education classes of that same grade level in that same school so we can mainstream the special needs children back into the regular population. So that would have to be analyzed. How would we handle preschool in any of these scenarios? What kinds of master scheduling changes would be need to be made? And that really connects with the uh, personnel as well. One of the things we could readily have done is we are finished, we are at the end of the last demographic study, and there are people who are experts. They look at live births, and I will not get into the statistics behind this, um, getting one of those studies done, and then obviously um, the stakeholder input. So these are all the things that although we talked about these things, they need further study, and a lot of that is more administrative work that a parent could do or even a staff member of such as a teacher. I do want to mention, I believe she's, there were many tremendous committee members. I also would be uh, remiss if I did not mention Mrs. Napoli, who is our data spreadsheet genius, uh, put in a lot of extra time for me to be able to have all this data at every meeting. So, what are the next steps? When I stop talking, it will first be an opportunity for the board 
to have questions or comments. It will then be opened up to public comment, and I will go over how public comment works in a moment. To make sure that we are giving people every opportunity, this is being repeated at the May 20th board meeting. So that any parent or guardian or family member or community member that couldn't be here tonight has another chance for this whole process to repeat itself. Sometime between now and the end of the school year, the board is going to look at all this and they're going to say, we want you to do this. We want you to study that. Take this step. Um, I will emphasize, nothing is changing for next year. No reconfiguration, no redistricting is not for next year. The earliest anything would change would be the 2021 school year. So with all that said, I am going to just quickly go over how public comment works. Um, again, uh, President Carmen will, after the board has a chance, open it up to public comment. You are asked to step up here to the podium. There is a sheet where we ask you to sign in. There is also the full policy of the board that governs public comment. We ask that you speak for no more than five minutes. If everyone who wants to talk for five minutes has a turn, the board president could allow people to come back up. But the goal is to do this in a respectful manner that allows everyone who wishes to be heard to have an opportunity. So, before I um, turn it back over to President Harmon, first of all, again, I cannot thank the Stakeholder Committee enough. It was a pleasure to work with you, and you just did a tremendous job. Of course, everyone who took the time to come out tonight, we appreciate as well. Again, next meeting, May 20th. And then after that, we will continue to update you in a lot of different ways. The email, the Facebook, the school messenger, hard documents home if we need to, so you know where is this all progressing as the year continues.